pigmentation and metamorphosis, but were the products of intelligent design, even if they had no idea whatsoever who this people group was that made these artifacts and left them there. Similarly, if astronauts were to discover a pile of machinery on the backside of the moon, they would be justified in inferring that this was the result of intelligent design, even if they had no idea whatsoever who the designers of these things were or how they came to be there. In order to recognize an explanation as the best, you don't need to have an explanation of the explanation. In fact, think about it. Requiring that would immediately lead to an infinite regress of explanations so that nothing could be explained. Because before you could recognize an explanation as the best, you'd have to have an explanation of the explanation. But before you accepted that, you'd need to have an explanation of the explanation of the explanation. But before you could accept that, you'd have to have an explanation of the explanation of the explanation of the explanation. And so on to infinity. Nothing could ever be explained, and therefore science would be destroyed. So Dawkins' principle is actually destructive of the whole scientific enterprise. But in any case, in order to recognize that intelligent design is the best explanation, you don't need to be able to explain the designer. Whether the designer has an explanation or not can simply be left an open question for future inquiry. Second problem with Dawkins' objection. Dawkins thinks that in the case of a divine designer of the universe, the designer is just as complex as the thing to be explained, so that no advance in simplicity is made. The explanation is just as complex as the effect to be explained. Now, this objection raises all kinds of questions about the role played by simplicity in assessing competing hypotheses. For example, there are many other factors besides simplicity which scientists weigh in assessing competing hypotheses. Things like explanatory power, explanatory scope, plausibility, and so forth. An explanation which has greater explanatory power and greater explanatory scope will be preferred over another explanation which is weaker in explanatory power and scope even if the bad explanation is simpler. So you may be quite willing to give up simplicity in order to gain explanatory power or scope. Simplicity is not the only or even the most important of the criteria in assessing the best explanation. But leave those interesting questions aside. Dawkins' more fundamental mistake lies in his assumption that a, a divine designer is just as complex as the universe, and that is plainly false. As a pure mind or consciousness without a body, God is a remarkably simple entity. A mind or a soul is not a physical object which is composed of parts. In contrast to the contingent and variegated universe with all its inexplicable constants and quantities, a divine mind is startlingly simple. Dawkins has obviously confused a mind's ideas, which may indeed be very complex, with the mind itself, which is a simple substance having no parts. So Dawkins is just confused in thinking because a mind's ideas might be complex, that a mind itself is complex, which is simply a, a fallacy. And therefore, postulating a divine mind behind the universe most definitely does represent an advance in complexity, or rather an, an advance in simplicity by postulating a simpler explanation for whatever that might be worth. So the central argument of Dawkins' book thus fails to show that the alternative of design is in any way inferior to the many worlds hypothesis. In fact, I have to say his smug and self-congratulatory attitude at this pitiful objection which he sustains even in the face of repeated correction by prominent philosophers uh, like Keith Ward and Richard Swinburne is really marvelous to behold. So of the three alternatives before us, physical necessity, chance, or design, the most plausible of the three is, I think, uh, design.
Finally, the last argument to be discussed is the ontological argument. And the version that I've presented comes from Alvin Plantinga. Now, let's simply summarize the argument. It's possible that a maximally great being, or God, exists. A maximally great being is a being which is omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect in every logically possible world. Two, if it's possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. Three, if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. That's true by definition because part of maximal greatness is to exist, <coughs> pardon me, in every logically possible world. Four, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. Five, if a maximally great being exists in the actual world, then a maximally great being exists. Uh, six, therefore, a maximally great being exists. Now, steps two through six of this argument are relatively uncontroversial. Most philosophers will agree that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows that God must exist. So the real primary issue to be settled is <coughs> what grounds exist for thinking the premise, one, that it's possible that a maximally great being exists is true. Now Dawkins devotes six full pages brimming with ridicule and invective to the ontological argument, but he does so without raising any serious ver uh, objection to Plantinga's ontological argument. He reiterates a parody of the argument which is designed to show that God does not exist because he says a God who created everything while not existing is greater than a God who created everything while existing. And therefore this proves that God does not exist because a God who could create everything while not existing is greater and therefore would be maximally great. Now ironically this parody, far from undermining the argument, actually reinforces it. For think about it, a being which creates everything while not existing is logically incoherent and therefore impossible. There is no possible world in which a non-existent being exists. <laughs> right? That's logically incoherent. So there is no possible world in which a non-existent being exists and creates everything else. So that his parody is based upon a logical incoherence. Such a being isn't possible and therefore doesn't exist in any possible world. So what the atheist has to maintain is that the concept of a maximally great being is similarly logically incoherent. It has to be like the concept of a married bachelor or a round square. But the problem is that it's not like that. There, there's nothing incoherent about the idea of a being which is omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect, and exists in every logically possible world. That seems to be a perfectly coherent conception, and therefore that actually supports the truth of premise one, that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. Dawkins also chortles, I've forgotten the details, but I once piqued a gathering of theologians and philosophers by adapting the ontological argument to prove that pigs can fly. They felt the need to resort to modal logic to prove that I was wrong. Now folks, this is just embarrassing. The ontological argument just is an exercise in modal logic. Modal logic is the logic of the possible and the necessary. This just is a demonstration in modal logic. So I can just imagine Dawkins making a, a fool of himself at this professional conference with this spurious parody in the same way that he embarrassed himself with his flyweight objection to the teleological argument in the face of correction by eminent philosophers and theologians. Well, I'm, I'm over time at this point. I'm sure that you can think of substantive objections or questions to the arguments that I presented, but at least I hope to have shown this morning 
that the objections raised by Richard Dawkins and therefore by the new atheists in general to these traditional arguments for God's existence are not even injurious, much less deadly. All right, do we want to take a break now or to have uh, some time for questions? <laughs>